thank you so much again for joining us for our symposium on religious freedom and religious extremism, Lessons from the Arab Spring, sponsored by the Religious Freedom Project of Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. I am Timothy Shaw, and I am Associate Director of the Religious Freedom Project, and it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce the second of our three panels today, the panel that we are calling our keynote conversation on the policy implications and the policy lessons that can be drawn from the connection between religious freedom and religious extremism, especially for those countries of North Africa and the Middle East that have been affected by the Arab Spring. The idea that religious freedom may be an effective policy strategy for addressing religious extremism is not new. Consider the policies that Thomas More designed for the island of Utopia about 500 years ago. In Utopia, he writes, quote, there had been constant quarrels about religion, and the various warring religious groups had refused to cooperate with each other. So then, a new leader came along, Thomas More writes, who, quote, made a new law by which everyone was free to practice what religion he liked and to try to convert other people to his own faith, provided he did it quietly and politely by rational argument. But More continues, quote, if he failed to convince them, he was not allowed to employ violence or personal abuse. So in Thomas More's Utopia, a policy of religious freedom was the effective solution for the problem of religious extremism, religious conflict, and religious violence. Well, that was utopia. <laughs> what about the real world? To discuss that question, we are delighted that we have an all-star panel of experienced policymakers who between them, in my rough calculation, have something like 50 or so years of experience making policy not for utopia, uh, but for the United States government. <laughs> and uh, to lead us in the discussion of this crucial issue, we are thrilled that we have Will Inboden, who is himself a foreign policy all-star, uh, and uh, also uh, who we're proud to say is a fellow with our Religious Freedom Project. So let me introduce uh, Will. He is assistant professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and distinguished scholar at the Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas, Austin. He is also a non-resident fellow with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Previously, he served as senior vice president of the Legatum Institute and as senior director for strategic planning on the National Security Council at the White House. Will has also worked at the Department of State as a member of the policy planning staff and as a special advisor in the Office of International Religious Freedom, and also uh, had significant experience on Capitol Hill. So it's our great pleasure to have Will, who will be moderating uh, the discussion uh, right now. Okay, great. Will, take it away. All right, well, th thank you, Tim. Thank you to everyone for uh, turning out on this uh, uh, lunchtime on, on a Friday for uh, what we hope will be a very stimulating, provocative, and, and insightful question. Uh, as the moderator, I'm uh, humbled to be in the presence of, of these three. I won't go through their lengthy bios. Uh, uh, suffice it to say, e any one of them would be uh, more than capable of delivering a keynote address on his own. So the fact that they have uh, agreed to come together for a conversation, I think, is all the more riching. As uh, Tim mentioned, there's also a tremendous uh, amount of uh, statecraft experience represented on this panel. Uh, by my calculation, uh, our members together have served in seven presidential administrations, every one since, literally every one since the Ford administration. Uh, and during that time, they uh, presided over some tremendous significant geopolitical events, and also relevant to our purposes today, uh, worked on some profound democratic transitions, uh, whether the democratic transitions in Asia, the democratic transitions in Latin America, certainly in Eastern Europe at the end of the Cold War, and now more recently the, the Arab Spring. Now, lest that collective description make it sound like our panelists are long in the tooth, I also know that they're very young, spry, and energetic, and have many of their best years still ahead of them. So um, anyway, uh, I think they all started in the Ford administration when they're 
about eight years old, so that's why. Yeah, let's do, let's do these. So anyway, so. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, what we'll be doing is a structured conversation here. I'll put, be putting a number of uh, questions to our, our panelists as a whole, as well as to individual ones. And then after a, a suitable amount of time, we'll turn it over to the audience for, for questions from, from the audience as well. So uh, first question is for uh, Steve Hadley. Um, Steve, during his presidency, uh, President Bush uh, spoke often of his belief that the peoples of the Arab world both desired and deserved democracy. I want to know, do, would you view the events of the Arab Spring as a vindication or perhaps a cautionary tale for, uh, for some of the vision that President Bush laid out, which you were very involved in as well? Well, I, I think the place we have to start is that the revolutions in the Middle East are being made by the people of the Middle East. This is their revolution. This is not made in America. This is not made by George Bush. The one thing I think we can claim for President Bush is that he, looking at 9-11, was willing to say and articulated very clearly publicly that U.S. policy had been wrong for about 50 years that it was premised on the notion that you could uh, support tyrants and authoritarians in the Middle East and get stability. And we thought we needed that stability over 50 years for oil and to keep out the Soviets and all kinds of uh, reasons. And he, one of the lessons he drew from 9-11 was that was a bad deal, that supporting authoritarians, instead of getting a stability, really got terrorism because it, it created a culture of despair and lack of hope that made the Middle East a recruiting ground for, for extremism. And he came out and said that very clearly and that the United States had to have a different policy. It had to have a, a policy that supported freedom, democracy, human dignity, the right to people to take uh, control of their own future. And that that was not only the right of people, but also would over time lead to a, a real kind of stability, a stability based on democracy and freedom. And I think he was right. And uh, I know I think um, he takes some, uh, celebrates with the people of the Middle East that freedom and democracy are finally coming to the Middle East. Now, there are going to be, you know, people talked about Arab Spring and someone said, this is an Arab Spring, this is an Arab awakening. And we're going to have spring, fall, winter, summer, ups, downs. It's going to take a long time. But at least we can say that freedom and democracy are beginning to be on the march in the Middle East, and that's a very good thing. Great, thanks. Uh, for, for Dennis, uh, it appeared uh, at times from the outside like the Obama administration was caught by surprise by the initial advent of the Arab Awakening or, or Arab Spring. I don't mean that in an accusatory way. I think all of us were caught by surprise. But uh, could you reflect uh, from your time there on the inside how this played out uh, within the Obama administration? Uh, what, what do you think the administration got, got right? What do you think they, uh, they maybe got, got wrong in responding to, to these events in real time? Um, well, first I think you're right about the fact that everybody was caught by surprise. Yeah. The truth is that nobody predicted what would happen. And I, I'll tell you a little story because it's, it, um, it tends to validate this point. In the, in the summer of 2010, uh, the president signed out a, a decision memorandum that was to launch a whole of government review of our approach to the Middle East on the question of reform. And it was based on the premise, basically, that, Steve, you were describing that President Bush had articulated that the kind of ref the, the, the reality of the region was creating maybe an illusion of stability, but not, not the fact of stability. And that you couldn't, the formula that existed was not one that was going to be sustainable over time. Uh, and that, in a sense, our relationship with some of our uh, Arab friends that were authoritarian regimes that were rooted in traditional strategic sets of interests uh, were understandable at one level, but the cost of association with them was going to go up because their ability to sustain themselves in power was going to become increasingly uh, more problematic. Now, I tell you this not simply to create a backdrop, but in the course of, of doing this review and taking a hard look at a lot of the questions associated with our relations, uh, we 
not only had a lot of internal discussions, we brought in some people from some of the think tanks uh, around town and around the country, but we also, at one point, brought in 30 activists from the region. And I met with them, and this was six weeks before Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire and effectively set the region on fire. And they were from everywhere in the region. And they, when I say activists, they were, uh, almost every one of them had been arrested. They all had a huge stake and belief and commitment to transforming the realities in the region and to changing what was the authoritarian situations they found themselves in. And at one point I asked the question, how soon do you think change could come? And 30 of them, and they were from Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, uh, Yemen, Bahrain, meaning they covered the whole breadth of the region. Not one of them thought change could come soon. Now this is six weeks before Mohammed Bouazizi sets himself on fire. And it's not a criticism of them, it's that they looked at the situation like many of us did and said, as we look at this in the abstract, we say this is not a sustainable reality. But when they looked at the reality of trying to, to change governments that they viewed as having a monopoly on the means of violence, no hesitancy in terms of being prepared to use it, a determination to keep themselves in power, uh, a sense that they themselves were not organized in a way that would necessarily produce change, uh, they, made, they drew the conclusion that you wouldn't see change happen very quickly. So people who had the greatest stake in change themselves, and they, by the way, they also, it wasn't just that they represented geographically the breadth of the region, they also represented what I would say demographically different age groups. And they didn't see it coming. And we can go through all the reasons why it, it eventually erupted. So the fact that they didn't see it coming is, is not a, doesn't then become a huge surprise that we didn't see it coming when it came. Uh, when it came, the administration was, was confronted with a lot of very immediate dilemmas. And there were debates within the inside, which won't surprise you, uh, between those who said, look, this is not only the right thing from a value standpoint, it also represents kind of the, the sweep of history, and we should be on the right side of history. There were those uh, who felt that, um, particularly when you looked at Egypt and, and, f and saw the relationship with Mubarak, their focus was, okay, we see that, that uh, you know, change is coming, but you can't simply sweep away 30 years of friendship, and how will we be seen by the rest of the region? What about uh, some of our other friends? How will they interpret this? And, and it won't surprise you that many of our friends from different parts of the region were at the highest levels were calling in and saying, for God's sakes, if you're going to jettison Mubarak, what does that mean about us? And so, you know, in the real world of policy making, you have to make choices between uh, options, many of which are not all that desirable, and sometimes you choose the ones that you think are least bad. In this particular case, the, a judgment was made as it related particularly to Egypt uh, to try to convince Mubarak that uh, his own desire to preserve a kind of Egypt uh, that he himself, uh, you know, put a premium on, which was stability, the only answer to that was to create a transition. And there was a transition where he would leave uh, and where his son wouldn't replace him. And so they, you know, we, uh, and even, even I have to say, even within the context of what I just described, there was a debate about how hard to push that versus uh, how, how to manage this. And um, the basic decision that in the end was made was a decision that uh, would have us uh, actually had the President speak to, to Mubarak, in addition to the fact that the decision was made to send an emissary, Frank Wisner, uh, to, to try to manage a transition. And again, when you look at the debates, the, you can imagine the, the debates between those who are saying it's not only the strategic interests of some of our friends in the region that we, who are going to be uh, highly unsettled if it suddenly looks like you're walking away from a, a friend of 30 years, uh, but also there's the question of, all right, what's going to replace them? Uh, and um, what is the, what's the reality about trying to, to manage the transition? And, and that, frankly, to take the point that Steve made earlier, we're not the ones who are driving this. We're not the ones who are creating this. We're not the people who are the, the you know, two million people in the street. Uh, how much influence do we have, and what's the best way to try to exercise it? Uh, and, you know, there was a conversation that the president had with Mubarak uh, 
that can only be described as um, a dialogue uh, of the deaf because the president was, was saying to Mubarak, you know, the, you've, you, were a, you, know, you were a child of Egypt, you were a patriot, you were, uh, you know, you've, you've sought to do a great deal for your country, and now the, the, you know, the greatest thing you can do for your country is to help to manage that transition. And Mubarak said, and I have to say this was words that echoed in my ears because over the years when I had served in different administrations and, and, uh, and I had dealt with Mubarak, even though my main responsibility when I was dealing with Mubarak was on the peace issue, there were a number of times when I would raise the issue of reform with him uh, and even I would raise the issue of what was in his media with him and he would tell me I was naive, that I didn't understand, uh, and that uh, I didn't understand his people. He did, and you know, if he wasn't there to preserve stability, the chaos that would emerge, the you know, the Muslim Brotherhood would take over, you know, and he would paint these scary scenarios, and and I would <coughs> explain to him, you know, it's hard to see how, if things didn't change, that he wouldn't face that anyway, or he wouldn't face it anyway. Well, in this particular case, in this conversation, you know, the president you know, was trying to persuade him and he, he came back to the president and said, you don't understand my people. Uh, you will see this will all blow away in a few days. And the president literally said, you know, was saying to him, you know, what if you're wrong? You know, you could be wrong. And he said, and Mubarak said, no, no, you don't understand. And the president said, look, let's talk again in 24 hours. Just let's just see. And, uh, and he said, no, let's do several days. <laughs> And, you know, there was just, he was living in a world of complete denial. Um, I will say this, that it, after he made his initial speech, we got a lot of feedback from a lot of the people in the opposition that that night after he made the initial speech where he talked about leaving, we talked about waiting until September, where he made it clear his son would not succeed, his family wouldn't succeed him. Um, we got a lot of feedback that indicated that actually the mood was, all right, let's not humiliate him. Uh, and, you know, in effect, we have, uh, you know, we've succeeded because he's actually going to leave and there's actually going to be a transition and the like. Uh, and everything changed the next day when, you know, suddenly those identified with him descended on Tahrir Square, descended on the demonstrators uh, and wielded violence. And at that, the, everything switched and the game was over. But he still didn't understand it and he was still living in denial. So, look, the... What I think is, as a broad principle, I think uh, the administration got right the fact that you had to manage transitions, but you also had to realize the limits of how much we would be able to manage the transitions. Uh, the effort to identify with the spirit of what was in the street was, I think, right. Uh, you know, one can debate the question of should we have done more sooner? Uh, there's the question of what it is exactly that we could have done more sooner. Uh, you know, there was an effort made where th that I think was right uh, to realize that we ourselves were unlikely to have the kind of credibility that others there, people on the street basically would look to us as being a symbol of change. We were too associated for too long with the Mubarak regime to have that kind of credibility. I can also tell you that um, <coughs> I, had a, I spoke to a number of Egyptians who basically were saying to me, what, do you, what does the United States know about transitions? You know, Hungary knows something about transitions. Poland knows something about transitions. Chile knows something about transitions. Indonesia knows something about transitions. But when did you have your transition? And one of the things that we did try to focus early on was not just working with the EU, but working with a number of those countries that had had transitions to see if we could develop what were a common set of themes that we all would be using because that would have a greater likelihood of, of receptivity and have a greater degree of credibility. Um, you know, could we have done more to, uh, to try to help the forces that needed, I think, greater um, identity uh, and organization? Uh, we certainly could have tried, and I think we, we did to some extent. You know, I think that the... Uh, in retrospect, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I think on the issue of what we could have been doing and saying publicly, I think we were basically right. Uh, I think on the issue of, of how we could have tried to orchestrate with others uh, 
more sooner, maybe we could have done more. Uh, on the issue of how we dealt with the, and have dealt with the SCAF, meaning how the Obama administration dealt with them, here again, there were a lot of uh, high-level entreaties to them. Uh, the question was maybe more could have been done with them sooner to impress upon them uh, the need uh, to adopt not just the words of civilian transition, but much more credibility when it came to how they were responding to, um, you know, real freedom of speech. I mean, some of what they did and the people they put in prison early on just undercut their own credibility. And I think they were also creatures of habit, and it was hard for them to break with that. Uh, you know, the short answer is getting this exactly right is maybe easy to describe theoretically and hard to do practically. Mm. Yeah. Okay, All right, a question for, for Elliot. Uh, Elliot, during a good part of the Bush administration, you were the, you had the unique dual roles of being the, uh, the White House's point man on democracy and human rights and religious freedom promotion and also the point man for Middle East policy. Uh, and we heard Steve reflect a little bit on some of President Bush's uh, strategic vision and, and new calculations for the, the order in the region. As you look back now on your time in the Bush administration, if you could engage in a little bit of reflection and self-criticism perhaps, um, what, what do you think the administration got right and what do you think the administration could have done better on these issues of uh, democracy, reform, human rights, religious freedom in the broader Middle East? Self-criticism is very Chinese. You get up and <laughs> yeah, right. sit in a hard chair. This is a, a, a chair. Maoist panel here yeah. from the 19... Yeah, that's right, the 1960s. So. Um, and then you head out to the countryside. <laughs> exactly right. right. Yeah. Dig ditches. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I don't think so. Um, they may look like undergrads out there, they're, but they're peasants. I yeah, see. That's okay, that's right. So, okay, so. Uh, well, I think, I think that after 9-11, President Bush uh, began an effort to understand what happened. Mm -hmm. Why did it happen? why uh, this hatred, and hatred of what? Uh, and why from Saudi Arabia in particular, so many of the, of the uh, bombers? Um, and I think he came to a view which Steve described. Um, that is that it was, and it was a view that was beginning to be um, more broadly expressed in the region, the famous 2002 Arab Human Development Report from um, from UNDP, that there was a freedom deficit in the region. That is, that what the, uh, what the bin Laden, for example, was most against in the whole world was against the Saudi regime. Um, and that you could, you could, you could see this as a, as a, um, a problem in the, in the political, especially political organization of these regimes. Um, and he, we, we saw this term freedom deficit. And um, I think that analysis was correct. Uh, and it led the president to the view that these regimes were not actually stable. Now, uh, he said, you know, the, the change is the work of generations. He did not say, you mark my words in a year, this is all, this will all be gone. We thought it would take a lot longer. Um, but I think the fundamental analysis that these were not stable regimes because they relied exclusively on force was correct. And I would make an exception here to some extent for the monarchies which have some legitimacy, varying degrees of legitimacy, but not zero. But in these, what I would call the fake republics, what did they have to say for themselves? You know, they didn't have monarchic legitimacy. Uh, they were repressive and violent. And they weren't producing, if you want to compare it to China. Uh, you couldn't say, well, look over a generation, the number of people who have been moved out of poverty. No arguments, really, in favor of these regimes except inertia, which, after all, had, had worked. I mean, I remember in discussions of this, you could talk about why, in theory, they were all going to fall, but we've been hearing about that for a long time, and the only, in the Arab world, the only regime that had fallen was the one that we brought down in Iraq. The others, decade after decade after decade. Um, now, um, I think uh, the president began to act on this. You remember the, um, the NED speech, the 20th anniversary of the National Endowment for Democracy, 2003, I think, and his second inaugural. And for Egypt, uh, Condi Rice's speech at American University, Cairo, in 2005. 
Now, could we have done more? Um, yes. And the pressures against doing more, Dennis has referred to some of, they're very great because we, you know, the United States government is not an NGO. An NGO which has the luxury of having one interest, religious freedom, political freedom, anti-slavery, whatever it is. The United States government has a number of interests. Dennis mentioned that a, a number of his conversations with President Mubarak were in the context of seeking Arab-Israeli peace. Uh, we had the same, I'll call it a problem, which is that once in 2007 and 8, the administration was pushing hard again at and after Annapolis for an Israeli-Palestinian peace treaty, um, the view of President Mubarak softened because he was, in fact, very useful. And indeed, the Egyptians still are useful. Now it's the scaf in the Israeli-Palestinian context. Um, so I would say in the long run, I think this was a, this was a mistake. Someone who saw some who was in Cairo recently and met with um, secularists, liberals, and Muslim Brotherhood officials said to me that all of them said, we remember very fondly 2004, 5, 6, when you were really pushing Mubarak, because he did respond by opening the political space yeah. some. Um, I think that had we pursued a policy over, you know, 35, 40 years, of, of greater pressure on these regimes, um, more political space would have been created, which would have benefited us in the sense that people would not just remember 2004, 5, 6, but say, you were always on our side against these regimes. And it would benefit them, because what's happened now is um, regimes where there was no politics, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, um, now are open for politics, and they have no practice. They haven't moved slowly and steadily into greater degrees of political activity. They go from zero to 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And maybe if the United States had over five or six presidents, um, we can go back to Ford um, if we want, or General Grant, um, <laughs> maybe had we been pushing harder all along, um, maybe there would have been greater political space and the shock of trying to develop it uh, from, from nothing would be uh, less. And I guess I'd make one more point, and that is uh, it would be especially useful to the people who the United States tends to view as the most, the closest to us, which is to say, liberals in the, in the general sense, people who want a kind of secular um, liberal state um, because they're the ones who have had, who have zero experience, whereas the brotherhoods in various countries seem to. Um, when I argue with um, friends who, who bemoan the passing of, politically, of President Mubarak, one of the things that I point out is, you know, we are where we are in Egypt, and they are where they are in large part due to Mubarak, who did not crush the Muslim Brotherhood. He played footsie with the Muslim Brotherhood, which always had, you know, a negotiation. You want 80 seats in Parliament. No, you can only have 70. Well, you can have 90. He crushed the center. And then that's one of the reasons. Admittedly, it's not the reason. It's one of the reasons that the center is uh, quite weak and got, uh, what, 20% in, uh, in the recent election. Thanks. Well, we've uh, heard each of our panelists reflect in some ways on uh, uh, his, his own experiences and assessment of his, his time in office. One thing I've been uh, struck by is the existential sympathy, if you will, that policymakers from different parties often have for each other, uh, even if there may be significant <laughs> policy differences, usually for the, the man or woman who's sort of sat there in the office, had to make some of the tough decisions that, that uh, all three have, have referred to. There's a sense of, yeah, it's really hard. And, and uh, it's one thing to sound pop off on the op-ed page about what you think should be done, but for those who've actually been there, it's another thing altogether. On the other hand, for those who have uh, held the position, sometimes the critiques can be more pointed as well, because you do feel like you have a sense of 
what actually can and can't be done. So with that preface, uh, I'd like to give our panelists a chance to assess uh, each other's administrations. It's not, not, not personal grading, but uh, Steve, if we, can, if we can start with you, what would be your assessment of the Obama administration's record thus far on <laughs> democracy, religious freedom, and the Arab yeah. Spring? Dennis, you'll get your chance as well. So this is, yeah, this will be going both ways. So I, I get a couple uh, questions that Will's going to ask, and I see this one, and I laugh out loud. <laughs> you know, sorry, Will, we're not, we're not going to do that. Okay. Uh, you know, look, these are uh, very difficult issues, and I want to want to give you one more vignette that is relevant to what Elliot talked about, and it's not been written a whole lot about it. In 2005, and I'm you know, there are experts here who can correct the dates. The president, Egypt goes through elections, and the first one is the presidential election, and then the second is parliamentary in 2005 and six, and it's two stages. So uh, I, as national security advisor, invite Omar Suleiman, who's President Mubarak's right-hand man, to come to Washington. And Condi and I have just a dinner with the three of us. I think maybe John Bolton was there as well, at Condi's favorite Gosh. restaurant. Joshua. No, John Bolton, oh, interestingly really? enough, because there was a UN dimension of this, I think. And, yeah, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and we said to General Suleiman, this is your chance. This is Mubarak's chance. Let Ayman Noor out of jail, let him run, and run an open, free, and fair election. Mubarak is going to win. He's going to win with 69% of the vote. Who cares that it's not seven, it's 73 or 85? But have a free and fair election and have him campaign and have him describe to the Egyptian people what he's going to do. And we sat there for about two and a half hours. And he said, well, what about the security service? And we said, you know, there's going to be demonstrations. Don't crack down on them. And we talked about how you have to work with your security forces to, to maintain law and order, but in a, in a context of free and fair elections. We spent two and a half hours, and he was taking notes. And they did a lot of that. And Mubarak did go out and campaign. Uh, and after that election, the Egyptian press was saying, Egypt will never be the same. And so we said, great job. You're on the road. Go to the parliamentary elections. And the first round of the parliamentary elections occur. And the Brotherhood, not surprisingly, since Mubarak had destroyed the center, and the Muslim Brotherhood was the only vehicle for expressing dissent left, the Muslim Brotherhood started to do well. And Mubarak got scared. And in the second part of that parliamentary election, they cranked she crashed down with a vengeance. And at that point, our effort to get Mubarak to preside over a transition ended. It's not that we didn't keep talking about freedom and democracy, that the president didn't keep making the case with Obark, Mubarak, but we got, you know, in yeah. spades what Dennis talked about. You don't understand our people. We tried your experiment, and it blew up in our face. It's a hard business, and you know, one of the challenges for the Obama administration is for those regimes that have not had res revolutions, the monarchies, which as Eliot spoke out, have a legitimacy and are trying in their own way to reform. One of the challenges for the Obama administration is to help those regimes actually do a democratic transition before there's a revolution, not after. But I offer the vignette about Mubarak. It is very hard. And final uh, postscript. In the last meeting that President Bush had with um, King Abdullah of Saudi, and where he talked again, once again, about reform and, and, and applauded King Abdullah's uh, reform, uh, on the way out to the van when Abdullah was left, he said, Mr. President, I understand what you're saying, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Uh, man in his 80s, maybe 90s, you know, Bedouin, you know, trying to reform, but, you know, such a long way to go. So it's very hard, but one of the things I think the Obama administration has an opportunity to do is to try to get these regimes that have some legitimacy to lead their people to a democratic future without having to go through uh, the, the disruption of, of, of revolutionary change. Can I just okay, pick up yeah, please that? do. All right. um, I want to make a couple of comments. Uh, 
One is to offer f a further explanation on why there isn't a center. Uh, Eliot started it, and I want to I want to add to what he was beginning to describe. And the second point I want to make uh, will relate to the last thing that Steve was saying, because there has been a lot of focus within the Obama administration on precisely what you, you've been describing. And indeed, having precisely those kinds of conversations, which is you can see what's coming, get out in front of it, and then offering certain kinds of suggestions. But let me, let me offer the, uh, the first observation. Um, Mubarak very much did what Eliot was describing because, and he wasn't alone in this. I mean, Ben Ali did the same. Basically, all the so-called republics, they had no justification for why they were in power. They had no idea that explained what was their reason for ruling. Unlike the, the monarchies had dynastic legitimacy. You can say it has limits, but at least there was a semblance of legitimacy. They had none. Because they had none, they feared, in a sense, those who could create a narrative that would justify an alternative. And so what they did is, what, what Mubarak focused on was making sure that there couldn't be an alternative narrative. And there, therefore, it had to be, in a sense, a binary situation. It had to be him or the Islamists. In part, for our consumption, not just ours, but the West, but also internally, because he sought to create a sense of fear about that alternative. And he, and he played upon what has been historically a sense within Egypt in particular about the, the great value and virtue of stability. Now he did something along the lines of what Eliot was describing because he did play footsie with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamists. At a certain level they ruled out violence and they cracked down very hard on that and they were extremely brutal in that regard. And they, and they outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood party as, the Muslim Brotherhood as a party as such. But by the same token, they allowed the Islamists to take over all the professional syndicates. You know, Egypt has a very interesting history in terms, if you look at the judiciary going back to the 1920s. And over time, this developed a semblance of independence. And in a sense, they allowed the Islamists to come in and take over. You look at all the professional syndicates, whether it's the lawyers or the doctors, it was the mother, Muslim Brotherhood who came to dominate. And this was OK from Mubarak's standpoint. Because in a sense, this was the way he lived and let live with the Muslim Brotherhood. He gave them a kind of outlet. And yet, by the same token, anybody who was under the rubric of secular and liberal, no possibility of emerging, no tolerance for them. So you look at where what happened. Basically, we're in a situation where you had one place that was seen as being completely authentic and off limits, precisely because the regime didn't have legitimacy, which was the mosque. And in the mosque, you, were, you had freedom of speech. So people in the mosque could stand up and say things. And you can imagine, you come to the mosque and you see people who stand up and they're not giving in. And all, all, they knew how to play on the anger that people felt and the fact that they didn't have an alternative or an outlet. And so here was the mosque where you had a semblance of freedom of speech, where you were allowed to organize, so the, the brotherhood could organize, where the embodiment of being non-corrupt was seen and the sense of, of being, in a sense, the, also the embodiment of social justice was seen because they would engage in providing, you know, clinics. To, they would distribute few, food. When there was an earthquake in Cairo, you know, who was out there distributing food and blankets? It was the Brotherhood. It wasn't the regime. Every natural catastrophe, you would see no sign of the government, but you'd see the Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood didn't have to provide a social safety net for the whole country. They could do it in a very limited way, but it would be seen. So what emerges, and it's not just the case in Egypt, but it's why there's a built-in advantage that the Islamists have. You know, they are seen as being authentic because, first of all, they're Islam, and that's, in a sense, indigenous. Secondly, they're seen as being credible because they actually stand up and they say things. Thirdly, they're seen as being effective because they deliver some social welfare. Fourthly, they're seen as non-corrupt and embodying social justice the antithesis of the regime, and they're allowed to organize. And the secular liberal uh, alternative isn't there. First of all, they bear a stigma because they're secular, and the regime is secular. Secondly, they're not allowed to organize. So when the time comes and they're able to use, the, you know, the young generation is able to use social media and the internet, you know, they're able to organize around a principle of opposition. But they're not in a position where they've had the time to create in a sense, an identity, an agenda, a platform. 
where they can think about how do we now present ourselves and our identity to a public. They have all the disadvantages in the early going, and the Islamists have all the advantages. Now, there's one very interesting change in everything that's happened if we use the word awakening. And that is that this was a region that was characterized, since I'm in an academic setting, I'll, I'll use the jargon. This was a subject political culture, not a participatory political culture. And what's happened in the last year, and this is one of the reasons that I don't despair, although I'm not feeling easy about where things are. Uh, the fact is, people in this part of the world today increasingly see themselves as citizens, not as subjects. And as citizens, they should have rights. As citizens, they can make demands. As citizens, they have expectations. As citizens, they should be able to hold their governments accountable. What they don't have, and this gets to the point Elliot was making as well, they don't have institutions that are there that allow them to express what citizens would express. And it's, it's going to take time to build those institutions. And one of the things that has to happen now, playing upon their self-image of being citizens and the fact that they feel they have a voice and they're not simply going to give up that voice, it's important to create standards of accountability. And again, on our own, we can't do this because we don't have the credibility to be able to do it. And it's very easy to try to blame things on us. But the more the narrative of, of blame is the one that's adopted, you know, the more you're not going to see one house built, one job created, and it's not going to address what are the demands and expectations. So there are things that can be done, but you're going to have to create standards of accountability in, as it relates to the regimes where the Islamists will have all the advantages. Last observation, which gets back to what Steve was saying. It is essential, and the administration has done a lot of this, and it has, done, it has done it at a lot of different levels, and there have been sustained conversations, especially with the whole range of our friends, about you know, if the one thing you can see is that in the region you see a sense of citizenship emerging. And you're going to have to find ways to respond to that. You're going to have to create a sense of inclusion. You're going to have to create a sense that people have the means to participate in somehow shaping their own future and their own destiny. It's an easy thing to say, it's a hard thing to do, precisely because you get back to what King Abdullah said to, to President Bush. Many of them will say, we understand. I'm not going to identify the individuals who say this now, because they're in power. Many of them will say they understand, but they don't quite know, even with when we make suggestions, even when we suggest you know, ways that we, we and others can be helpful, they don't quite know how to take the steps that will be responsive without unleashing a set of forces that they fear will undo them. Uh, and there aren't too many people in power who are going to take steps that they think will actually undo their hold on power. Thanks. Well, uh, Dennis, especially since you brought up the question of the Islamists and the mosque and uh, the mosques, and also this uh, shift uh, in identity from subject to citizen, that brings us to uh, sort of the main topic for the gathering here today, which is the question of religious freedom. So, Elliot, I'm going to put this question to you first, but I'd like the others to, to reflect on it as well, is what is the role of religious freedom in these ongoing transformations? I mean, has, uh, when, when we hear religious freedom, is that a stalking horse for a greater role for Islamism, which in turn will be regressive, or is religious freedom potentially uh, a key solution to uh, pluralism and to creating these institutions and habits of citizenship uh, that, that Dennis was talking about, especially for non-Islamist Muslims as well as minorities such as, such as Christians and Jews. So. Why do they get the easy question? Yeah, okay, that's right. So, okay. <laughs> it, it seems to me a very difficult question. Yeah. Uh, these are countries in which, for the most part, um, there was a fair amount of religious freedom for the most part. Uh, the restrictions on religious freedom tended to be of two kinds, I think. One, minorities, mm -hmm. for example. Um, in many, many of these countries, there are laws against changing f your religion from Islam to another religion. Um, and then there were the, the restrictions that the state put on um, the Muslim Brotherhood and other uh, expressions of, uh, let's call it, Islamist uh, belief. Um, now, uh, the systems are open, and you can have something closer to popular sovereignty. Mm 
It raises a question of religious freedom again. And uh, it's interesting. I, I, I wrote a column in the Monday Washington Post that criticized Tunisia, not because it is the worst example at all of, of uh, difficulties, but because it's so important, because it was the first and it's kind of the model. It's the place that everybody says, well, Tunisia has a really good chance of making it. Um, the movie Persepolis was shown. Um, and this led to prosecutions of those who showed it on the grounds that it offended public morals because there was a scene in it in which one of the uh, people in the movie had a visualization in her mind of God, an image of God. Um, and I said that's a violation of, of a freedom of expression to go after, for the state to prosecute. And it is, and it is wrong. And I had a, um, a liberal... A Tunisian friend, sent me an email saying, no, 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 you're wrong. Here's why. We're trying. It's very hard. We're, this is brand new to us. We're trying to build a, uh, I think he would have said, a liberal democracy. And there are a million issues. And one of the toughest issues is precisely the kind of thing you're talking about. If you push those issues, you Americans, complete freedom of expression in the religious realm, then... Uh, Tunisians, none of whom want to see that kind of movie, and, and who are conservative Muslims at base, Tunisians are going to say, ah, the Salafists are right. This democracy stuff brings with it chaos um, and sacrilege and down the road prostitution, homosexuality, and that's the line that is, that is given uh, by the Salafists. And, you know, he's not wrong, but he's not right either. I mean, what I, what I wrote back to him was, um, the problem with what you're saying is there's no limiting principle. First of all, there are no Tunisians who want to see Persepolis, award-winning movie. Zero. And if there are only 20% of the country, then they don't count. Um, and if the argument is, well, you can't show a movie like that because the vast majority of Tunisians don't want to see it. Suppose the vast majority of Tunisians think that women shouldn't be allowed out of the house without a, a burqa. Is that okay too? Because the vast majority, there's no limiting principle. That's my problem with that argument. That, so I, I think what you're going to have is to some extent a competition among the freedoms that we want to see these countries adopt. Uh, you'll see this happen in election campaigns where um, uh, Islamists, let's say generally, will argue against the secular parties. They're going to take you down the road that's going to end with French-style secularism, where there is no place for religion in the public square, and it's going to take you down the road to sort of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, which which will sell to some millions of people in the region. Um, but, but the answer to that, which is, okay, fine, then we won't have freedom of religion for 25 years until things settle down, cannot be right either. So I think it is a complicated interplay um, and not a simple question of, of uh, sort of saying, well, every kind of freedom you can think of should now advance at exactly the same pace and will advance at the same pace because, after all, they're all, um, they're all interrelated. I, I do think that we have a role here. Uh, the American style of, of uh, secularism is not the French style, and I think we should be trying to explain and to defend the American model because I think a lot of people in the Middle East are beginning to become, in Tunisia also, uh, familiar with it and realize that it may be a much better model for them than the... Uh, the French model, but also we, you know, we don't believe in, in um, majority rules, period, end of sentence, end of paragraph. We believe in liberty under law. We have a constitution. It has three articles to begin with about what, how the state is constructed, then it has ten amendments about freedom. And I think that we do need to say repeatedly and out loud that we don't view democracy as uh, the ability of those who get 51% to impose anything they like on everybody else. That's not what this struggle is all about. Uh, Steve. Yeah. 
I want to pick up on, on that. Um, I think, you know, the religious freedom is extremely important to us, extremely important, I think, as a value. You know, I was, uh, I looked at the Ten Amendments Elliot was talking about and the First Amendment, and I thought to myself, well, I better check that. I think it starts out with freedom of speech. And for those of you that don't have your pocket constitution <laughs> with you, actually the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And only then do you get free speech and assembly and all the rest. And I think because in some sense, if you've got freedom of religion, the other parts of that amendment follow on as corollaries. So freedom of religion is very important. But as lawyers say, hard cases make bad law. And if we force these regimes coming out of their history as a first issue to deal with that question of how far does freedom of religion reach, an issue that has bedeviled our country for 200 years, you will hobble their democracy. And I think that's Eliot's point. It's very difficult to draw that line. We're struggling to do it after 200 years. If we put that on these governments as a first order business, they won't make it. So what should we be doing? I think something short of that, something that will enable the resolution of those qu questions but does not force them prematurely. And that is religious tolerance. And that's where I would make the focus. Marwan Washer, who's known to a lot of you, I was on a panel with him a month or so ago and he said something I thought was very profound. He said, you know, in the Middle East, neither Arab nationalism nor political Islam had a tradition of tolerance and pluralism. And that's what the Middle East needs. Now, why does he say that? Because if the Middle East cannot solve the issue of tolerance, then you're going to have a situation where the political authoritarianism of the Mubaraks is going to be replaced by religious authoritarianism, which is what the Middle East is now, either Shia oppressing Sunni, Sunni oppressing Shia, and both of them beating up on the Kurds and everybody else. That's the threat to democracy, I think, and freedom under the long term in the Middle East. So what does that mean? We, and Elliot is right, we have a role. We need to be pushing for religious tolerance, for an understanding that majority rule does not mean you get to impose your values on everybody else, and that there has to be some space between the state and religion. And interestingly enough, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey helped in that in a speech he made in Cairo that really actually angered a lot of Islamists because he came and he said, look, the state should be equidistant from all religions and no religions. And the state ought to run a system where all religions have a place. But the premise of that is going to be tolerance. And I think that's what we need, because if there is going to be stability over the long term, there has to be tolerance as an element of democracy. Because if we go to sectarianism, where one religious group is able to impose their view on the other, that is also an instability waiting to go viral. So I would say tolerance. OK. All right. Dennis, religious freedom and Islamism and Arab Spring. You know, I, I think. Uh, I don't really have much to add to what either Elliot uh, or Steve have said. I think they've both captured it, not only effectively, but eloquently. The only thing I guess I would, and this is not a difference, and it's, it's probably even, it's not even, it, it may be simply a semantic way of saying the same thing that Steve just said. The, I think the critical point here is respect for minority rights. Uh, and if what, again, when I was talking about standards of accountability, I was trying to get at the idea that there are political standards of accountability and there are economic standards of accountability. And one of the political standards of accountability has got to be you preserve a space for competition. When you preserve a space for competition, it means you also have to respect the views and rights of others. So there has to be, and you were both saying this, that it can't, it's not majoritarian rule. There has to be you know, the, the right of those who get elected to have a right to, to make laws, but they have to respect the rights of minorities. Uh, and if there's a respect for, for minority rights, then by definition there will be tolerance. Uh, and, and this, I think, is going to be a really 
this is going to be a hard slog. And we see it, by the way, in the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood right now. Because you see, uh, you see a kind of, of pulling and thrashing there over exactly trying to define what the role of you know, religion is going to be as it relates to the state. Uh, everyone may say they're all for Article 2, which is the role of you know, Sharia uh, in, in Egypt and in, enshrined in, in law, but there actually is a difference among those who feel that it should be a much more omnipresent role and those who see there has to be a kind of separation. And the extent to which um, I agree with both uh, my colleagues up here on the idea that we have a role to play. The one thing I would add is I think we'll be more effective if we can build what amounts to uh, a large number of partners saying this internationally and repeating it over and over and over again so it becomes a mantra. And if it becomes a mantra, then it becomes something that the, the Muslim Brotherhood in particular will realize the world is watching at a time, by the way, when they want help. And if they want help, they've got to meet certain standards. But also their own publics will, it seeps into the bloodstream in a way with their own publics, who, as I said, I think they, they have the psychology of being citizens, but they don't have the existing mechanisms in terms of how to act on that. I want to put uh, one more question to our panelists before we turn, turn it over to the, the audience here for any of your questions as well. Um, and this is on a country that is not necessarily associated with the Arab Spring, but arguably some might say the early seeds of the Arab Spring uh, were not just in Tunisia in late 2010, but in Iran in 2009 with the Green Movement protests. You know, the headlines on Iran these days have uh, mostly to do with the impasse over their, their nu nuclear weapons program. But I'd like to ask the, the panelists, and Elliot, we'll, we'll begin with you, always putting the hard ones to you first. Uh, do you, given that the nature of the Iranian regime is almost defined by a particular, you know, brand of religious intolerance, do you think that religious freedom advocacy, whatever that might look like, might be a way in through the side door of promoting uh, reform, moderation, a uh, better path forward in, in Iran, especially given the religious minorities there, as well as the many Iranian Muslims who don't share the regime's yeah. interpretation? So. I do. Okay. I do, because, you know, <clears throat> I think the people of Iran um, have now been inoculated against this uh, form of political and religious organization by having the horrible experience of living under it. Um, they have seen what Velayati Faki really means um, in terms of intolerance and repression and corruption. Um, and I believe they would vote against it if uh, there were ever a free election. I'm, you know, which is why there's not going to be a, a, a constitutional referendum in Iran asking the people whether they want they want it anymore. So I think there, the, it's something that um, will change when this regime someday um, falls. I think there are many, many Iranians, we'll never know the exact numbers until Iran is free, but um, who believe that this is a corruption of, um, of Shia Islam. And in fact, I think uh, it is, and it is a great change from the way Shia Islam has been practiced, at least for the last couple of um, centuries. They've really, I think, essentially destroyed the system of having um, emulated leaders, Margia, by bringing them all under the control of the state, uh, which ruins them and the, the entire system. Um, and it, it is not, therefore, surprising that some of the most important resistance to the regime comes from Qum and comes from the clerical establishment that, 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 and in fact, there were several prominent Shia leaders, including some grand ayatollahs, who refused to vote in the recent elections uh, on the grounds that it was all such a corrupt, um, such a corrupt political system. Uh, ultimately, I, and they look around, I'm sure, and they realize that um, in some of the Arab countries, we've seen free elections in Tunisia, uh, in Egypt. Islamist parties win a free election, big victories. Um, but in Iran, the population is really disgusted um, with the kind of Islam that the state is forcing on them. And they realize what that means for the future of, of, uh, of Shia Islam in Iran. So I think um, uh, in the case of Iran, the, I'm going to carve out an exception here, but generally speaking, the push for 
religious freedom, I think, is very helpful overall in uh, arguing for a, a, um, a better future for Iran. I am troubled by one part of this picture, and that's the Baha'i. The, um, this regime has been really vicious and bloody and murderous when it comes to the Baha'i, who have had troubles in a lot of uh, Islamic countries, including Egypt, but in nowhere as uh, terribly as in Iran. And I, uh, I don't know whether um, the post-Islamic uh, Republic Iran um, we'll understand this is all part of the same disease of intolerance and, and um, should be ended, or whether what you'll find is people saying um, the state should not try to impose what is the correct form of Shia Islam on us, but, you know, the Baha'i are heretics, so that, that, you know, they, that can't be tolerated. One has to hope that this experience, of course, um, teaches tolerance not only for your own group, obviously, but by definition, the, the, the real meaning of it is, is tolerance, and I would hope we, they would then go beyond that to real religious freedom, but at least tolerance for those who are not in your group. Uh, Steve? If you I want to go back. I, I think the answer, I, I would have given a different answer, and I think Elliot's actually right. Uh, my answer now would be, having been informed by my colleague, <laughs> is yes but mm. in a sort of indirect way. And I go back <clears throat> actually to that First Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And those, you know, for 200 years there's a tension between those. And I, so I think it, it helps in Iran in the following way. If the watchword is free exercise of religion and free exercise of all religions. That requires a tolerance of all religions. And if you're going to have a tolerance of all religions, then you cannot have a state founded on a religion because it is inconsistent with freedom of religion and the free exercise of religion by all groups. And that really is the issue in Iran. You have a theocratic-based regime. And it is, the region is going to have to conclude that that has not worked to the benefit of the people. And that you can't establish a government on the basis of the slogan, Islam is the answer. If your question is, what is the answer to all political problems and to the question of how to found a political system, Islam is the answer. The region's going to have to decide on that sense to that question, no, it isn't. And in that sense, Iraq is ahead of Iran. And because of the remarkable character of uh, Ayatollah Sistani, who in the early days after 2003, when all the political parties came to him and said, you know, Ayatollah Sistani, tell us what to do. He was self-limiting as to power. That is to say, he said, no, that is a political question. You need to work it out. Um, I think that is the right answer. And I think as part of this tolerance dimension, the second piece of that is the region is going to have to understand that a political system based on religion is not the answer. Dennis? I don't have a lot to add. I mean, it's, it is one of the points that Elliot made, I think, is, is exactly right in Iran. What this regime has done is give religion a bad name. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in many respects, it's probably discrediting it for the future. And the, it's one of the ironies that it, it, is, it is, we've seen a decline in the power of the clerics under this regime. We've seen a militarization of the regime. And power is being taken, in a sense, away from the clerics. Um, you know, it's also, as Elliot was saying, the quietest school of Shia Islam, which is really the dominant one, which Sistani represents, uh, is, you know, is, is a polar opposite of what has emerged with, within Iran. So, you know, I think at some point we're, in Iran we're going to see a change. It's true, the focus is on the nuclear issue right now for reasons that are understandable. But there is a, I, having been trained initially as a 
specialist on the Soviet Union, and you can always tell someone's age. You were talking about it's not being long in the tooth, but you can always tell someone's age when they're a specialist on a country that no longer exists. Uh, but the reason I cite it as an interesting example, I see within Iran uh, what looks to be an analogous situation to the Soviet Union in the early 1980s, where uh, ideology, in this case religion as they describe it, has lost its relevance as being an idea to justify a rule. It's there as a cloak. And underneath the cloak, you have a kind of corrosive reality, which is eating away and will eat away uh, at this regime over time. You can never know and predict how long it takes for something like that to emerge. But I, I do think its, its impact in Iran on religion uh, is going to be increasingly negative over time. And we're not going to quite know what when this Maybe there'll be an evolution from this regime. Maybe that's what will happen first. But uh, if there isn't, then there could be a reaction, and there could be a reaction against religion. Okay, now we're going to uh, open it up to the floor for any questions. Uh, let me just say up front that the, uh, the three stipulations for any question are that you uh, first identify yourself, second, you keep it brief, and third, you keep it civil. So, um, all right, uh, right, right here. Yeah, right here in front. So thanks. Uh, a microphone is coming around just to your right. Amherst. Um, I really appreciated hearing the sort of inside stories of talking to Mubarak um, and I think it's really heartening to hear because there's often this perception that no one in the US government really is trying to push these issues and I think it's important. I'm wondering if you could share some stories about other regimes in the region, have those conversations happened. Um, I'm a specialist on Yemen and Jordan and I know in um, 2006 um, Yemen had its first real alternative candidate in its presidential election. Um, also, you know, in Jordan, I'm wondering if there's conversations there. Um, King Abdullah is, you know, our best friend, very Western, but, you know, the regime is not legitimate, I'm sorry to say. Um, the fact that uh, he doesn't have to perform pretend elections every four years and pretend that that's what his basis of legitimacy doesn't mean he's widely popularly supported. So I'm wondering if there's conversations there. I'm wondering if there's conversations with Saudi Arabia, um, the other religious, give religion a bad name, country in the region. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear more stories from that. Thanks. All right. All right. You know, uh, let me start. Um, one of the problems you run into, of course, is that, that while it is true that there are sometimes rulers who respond to these um, questions, which they probably see as lectures by these stupid Americans, um, they respond by saying, you don't know anything. You don't understand my country. That happens. But what happens with equal frequency is people saying, absolutely. You are right. I'm doing it. I'm with you. I'm ahead of you. <laughs> when uh, that is just, you know, problem for us. Now, there was a period at which it looked as if President Saleh was um, moving ahead with, with the democracy. I mean, he had, a, he had a, you know, a reasonably free election. He had an opponent in that election. And he had a couple of good years. Um, but I think looking back, one can say that, you know, he had not sort of read that constitution and said, this is it, I'm there. Um, he did it. He did what we wanted him to do. We and others in, in uh, position to um, give him money, uh, the EU, World Bank, IMF, and so forth. Um, and in the case of Jordan, I'm not sure. That is, the most effective lobbyist for Jordan is the king, as his father was. And there isn't anything you can tell the king that he hasn't thought of and said in his most recent speech um, <laughs> about the, the um, liberalization in Jordan. My own, my own sense of it is, in, I think, probably pretty close to what you were saying. That is, he's got a gigantic problem with the division between, uh, let's say, East Bankers and, and Palestinians, um, and the division of spoils in the government. He's got a system where, quite intelligently, the prime minister does not come from the royal family. He comes from politics, because that means that when people get annoyed after eight months, he's gone. Prime minister's gone. You get a new prime minister. 
The problem, of course, is if you do that every six or eight months, year after year, um, people will begin to doubt whether the changes and the reforms are serious. The king has promised uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring uh, real reforms. I don't think there have been real reforms. I, uh, you know, if I were, he's worried about something that we're not worried about, and this can be positive or negative, and that is, I don't think he's so much worried about what's going to happen between now and December. He's worried about whether his son will be king of Jordan. And he's got to sort of figure that out, and it's hard. I mean, I think if you try to think, what would you tell him if you were his uh, brother or, or uh, a close advisor in the royal court, how do you maneuver through this over time. Um, it's, you know, I would argue that, that the game he's been playing really for 10 years of, of, of what I think it's fair to call fake reform will ultimately um, have to be jettisoned in, for real reform. But I mean, given the political situation on the ground there, again, that's easy advice to give from Washington and hard to implement in Amman. Dennis or Steve? I guess I'll add a little. I, I, I think Elliot's description and analysis is, uh, is quite apt. In the case of Saleh, clearly there were extensive conversations over uh, uh, during, in the Obama administration uh, with him to try to, to move him out, to, to get him to accept the transition. It was, in this particular case, it was coordinated very closely with the GCC states because they were central to providing him the means uh, of staying in power. Uh, they, it, it moved with fits and starts. He, as was his want, he would make certain commitments. At a certain point, even everything was done, and then he would back away. Um, this is a guy who had obviously stayed in power for 30 years and, and uh, was pretty good at maneuvering. Uh, and. That meant not only internally among the tribes, but it also meant externally uh, with uh, choosing to have certain allies at certain points and then choosing to have different allies at different points. In the end, uh, he did go along with the, with the transition. Now, obviously, there are some very positive signs with this transition. There still are some open question marks in terms of the, uh, the weight of his own family uh, within the military, but it is pretty remarkable to look at what the reaction to these elections were, including among those who had been fighting each other. There was a genuine sense that something profound had now happened. So, you know, look, the problems in Yemen are enormous. They have few resources, um, they're running out of water, uh, and, um, you know, they, they still have Separatist, separatist impulses in the south, they have the Houthis in the north. They face real challenges, but the transition that is underway now uh, shows some promise. Clearly it needs a kind of support, and the fact is uh, Saleh in the end did leave. And, and it came after an enormous effort of a lot of players, including the administration, in a kind of repeated way. The number of conversations with him I can tell you were of high frequency and at high levels, including the president. Uh, and you know, you're also striking a balance in these cases between what's the right balance between what you say in private and what you do in public. Now, as someone who's worked in the Middle East for a long time, what I can tell you with a high degree of confidence, and I say this at a time when the truth is humility should be the order of the day, since none of us predicted what has happened because we're not the authors of what is unfolding there, we should in the first instance have a lot of humility. Uh, so when I say the following, I'm saying this not only with humility but also with some sense of experience. You can't limit what you do only to private. In this part of the world, especially with, with leaders, if it's only going to remain private, they will never take it seriously. Now how you, how you balance what you say in public with what you say in private, that's part of the art. This isn't a science, it's an art. And with each, with each leader, it's going to be different. And you're going to have to figure out what's the right balance, what's the right moment. When you say it, you obviously have more than one audience because you know, the others are going to hear it. So you have, to fig you have to calibrate this. But if you're going to operate only in private, you won't be effective. 
And what worked, I think, uh, ultimately in getting Saul out was at different times we ratcheted up what we were saying in public, but even then we, we coordinated that with the others who we, were, who we felt had even greater leverage in terms of moving him. So, you know, having written a book on statecraft, I could say an element of statecraft here is also realizing what you say in public if you have other actors who are key or at least are maybe pivotal in terms of helping to succeed in producing the outcome you seek, you also have to orchestrate what you're saying in public and not surprise them. It isn't just the, the, it isn't just the individual leader that you're working on, it's also who else may be your partners in this effort to manage a transition. Uh, and, so, and that was very much the case in terms of finally getting Salah to agree to go. Uh, I don't really have much to add to what Elliot said about Jordan. I think I do think that the, that the king now is, is more conscious of the need to try to carry out reforms that will be seen uh, and not just, be, not just from an image standpoint, but in reality, to be real. It is a very hard, uh, it's a very hard nut to crack because the backbone of his regime uh, also is the recipient of, of about 80% of the revenues of the government. And if you're really going to open up the system, and if you're really going to create the kind of reforms that will allow Jordan to flourish over time, you're going to have to manage the fact that they get 80% of the revenue now. You can't have them go cold turkey without unleashing forces that, in a sense, you're not going to want to see happen. So again, this is this is one of these cases where you can do a lot, you know, in the laboratory that seems to make sense, but in the real world where you have to carry it out, it's a very it's a very hard process to, you know, I think to orchestrate. I do think that the king has thought a lot in the last year about ways to create not only reforms but also to demonstrate that the reforms are real and also he's looking at models much more than was the case before. And the Moroccan model in some respects there's, you know, because both of these particular monarchies trace their lineage back to the prophet, they have a lot of, they have a lot in common. Uh, and I think he does look to Morocco um, with, you know, as one potential model. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the king of Morocco is a kind of interesting example of someone who did look at what was happening and decided that he had to try to get out front of it. Uh, and, you know, what has emerged there Again, there's never going to be anything that's going to be work perfectly, but it, what's emerged there, I think, has some potential. And I think that at least the King of Jordan is still trying to think through, is that an appropriate model, or are there others, or are there some hybrids that he will try to pursue? My sense is that he really is, genuinely is wrestling with this uh, and trying to proceed, but the context is a very difficult context, uh, and there are no simple answers for it. Steve, any uh, more? You may want to go to another question, so we have some okay, time. Okay, all right. For, okay. For um, okay, we've, we've got a uh, right here, Dan, Phil, Dan Philpott, and Mike over to Dan, please. Thanks. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm Dan Philpott from the University of Notre Dame, and thank you for an excellent panel. One of the things I appreciated about it is how much each analyst takes seriously the um, kind of sincere and genuine role of religion in world affairs. But it wasn't always so. In um, his book, The Eagle and the Lion, James A. Bill recounts the story of um, the CIA analyst uh, Ernie um, Olney, who in the 1970s saw religion as being very important in Iran, saying we've got to uh, look at this, that we have, we've got trouble on the horizon. But all of his colleagues uh, ridiculed him and uh, called him Mullah Ernie, was the sobriquet that, that he earned. And um, so my question is, how much... Um, uh, in U.S. foreign policy, as we you know saw in the attitude towards Mubarak, maybe hanging on too long and so forth, uh, how much is U.S. foreign policy shaped by a kind of um, widely shared secularism in the U.S. foreign policy establishment? A secularism which says that either religion is irrational or or that it's irrelevant. And how much is that is that still true um, today? Thanks, sir. Hmm. Steve, do you want to take first crack at that? Just you. Yeah, and we'll try to make our answers a little briefer. Um, 
there is, and Elliot alluded to this, there's an issue of what is secularism. I once had a conversation with Condi Rice, and I said, Condi, do you consider yourself a secularist? And she said, no, I'm a religious person. So what do we mean by secularism? Elliot pointed out, the French have a view, the state has to sit on to re religion to make sure religion does not intrude into public life. That's the kind of secularism I don't buy. Uh, I don't think our country buys. Um, I think uh, the, the best one is, is what Erdogan talked about in Cairo, an equidistance from all religions, uh, but a tolerance of all religions. Um, I think the, um, I think probably the uh, political establishment, diplomat establishment is somewhere between what I would call the American model and the French model. I think the American people are between the American model and something with perhaps even more active uh, place for religion. But I think the government has been conscious of that. I will just explain my own experience. I was uh, from 89 to 93, I was in the Pentagon. I co-chaired with the deputy, the number two person in the Turkish military, a high-level panel. And I used to talk to him one-on-one -on -one about how the Turkish establishment needed to provide a space for religious expression by the population. And I think that is something Americans broadly agree on and the diplomatic uh, community agrees on. And at various times, I think that is the model that we have urged on countries. You've got to provide a space for your citizens. President Bush used to say to the Chinese, your people in the end of the day will never feel for, fully satisfied and you will not get the best out of your people if you do not allow some space for the exercise of religion and the exercise of the spirit. I think that's roughly where the United States government has been. Okay, or Dennis? I, I, want, I would just add one quick thing. I think I, I agree with what Steve said. and I, I don't think that there's this kind of impulse of people on the inside who have this kind of generalized view I think it's, it's country by country, and you're looking at the circumstances. And I think that's actually, that's the way um, I think most analysts within the government will look. I don't think they come with a, a, priori, a priori view of it per se. I want to add one other point, and it's not, I think it's germane, but it's not directly on what you're asking. Uh, you know, having been someone who negotiated for a long time on Arab-Israeli issues, uh, oftentimes, I actually wanted to have religious spiritual leaders support the premise of tolerance and coexistence and speak against nonviolence. And I couldn't produce it ever. Uh, and I, I recently met with uh, an interfaith group from the area uh, and included Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and, and for the first time, they said they would like to see if they could play a role. Uh, and I, I said, you know, it's interesting that historically that's not been the case. And indeed, I, can, I recall in, in the year 2000, the Pope uh, went, uh, you know, went to, made a tour throughout the Middle East. And he went to Jerusalem, and he went to Ramallah. And, you know, they came, his representative came in advance to us and wanted to, wanted to create an ecumenical meeting where they could reinforce the importance of of tolerance, and he put together a meeting in Jerusalem that was a complete disaster. Uh, and so it was actually refreshing to see an interfaith group come now from the area and want to promote something. But so, in answer to your question, I didn't, at least in my own experience, I didn't view it as being it's something that was at odds with peacemaking, although I didn't want this conflict to turn into a religious conflict, because then you couldn't settle it. But I wanted religious spiritual leaders to see if they could reinforce the values of tolerance, nonviolence, and coexistence. Uh, the gentleman standing at the back, right there. Yeah, a microphone over there, please. Thanks. Okay, there it is. Mohammed Hafiz from the Naval Postgraduate School. Two quick questions. Uh, what is the Obama's, uh, Obama administration's um, view or assessment of Libya moving forward? Is democracy going to take hold in Libya?
or if not, what are the challenges that prevent that? And secondly, some have made the claim that the current administration is cooking the intelligence on Syria to prevent an intervention in Syria. What is, an assessment, what is your assessment of that? Okay. Well, Dennis, I think that's to you. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm, okay. ass right. I'm assuming it's to me. Okay. Uh, first, I'm not in the Obama administration, so you know, I, don't, I don't speak for the administration. Uh, they have plenty of spokespeople, and I'm not one of them. Uh, I would say, though, I mean, obviously, I was in the administration for most of what went on uh, on Libya, including uh, the intervention and its aftermath. Uh, I think that there, there is a continuing hope that what can emerge in Libya will be uh, a government that is largely representative. Uh, it'll be a government that, uh, you know, is not a government of tribes or sectarianism but it is a government that, would, that will be largely representative and inclusive, uh, representing there are, you know, that this is not a simple process to, to generate. The Prime Minister of Libya was recently here and saw the President. When you speak to the people who are in what is an admi interim administration in Libya right now, they are very much committed to trying to produce what would be uh, a representative democracy. Now they have, you know, Coming after Gaddafi and the absence of any institutions, it's both in some ways easier and harder because, you know, in other places there are what I would describe as sort of ersatz institutions. They're not real and they, in some ways you're, you're trying to take them and reform them. In Libya, you're trying to build something out of lar largely nothing. Uh, so there's a potential because of that, but there also are all sorts of splits within the country. There's no doubt that the, you know, the Islamists are trying to gain the upper hand, but when you talk to the people who are trying to, to manage the change themselves, uh, and many of whom, by the way, were educated here, they're in, incredibly impressive. Uh, they certainly are saying the right things. Whether they can deliver on it remains to be seen. But the administration is looking for ways to continue to bolster and move things in a certain direction. And, I, you know, I would just say on the, on the issue of Syria, I don't believe that, uh, that what just came out, at least where there were some intelligence briefings, I don't believe those were by design by the administration. I think they, they may reflect certain views within the intelligence community. It's not my understanding that they represent the, the, uh, the views of the administration. And we've got, got one over here. Yes, sir. I'm Stanley Kober, I'm a Georgetown alum. In October 1789, George Washington wrote a letter to Governor uh, Morris in Paris on the French Revolution. The revolution, he warned, he said is wonderful, but he also warned it is of too great a magnitude to be effected in so short a space and with the loss of so little blood. To forbear running from one extreme to another is no easy matter. And should this be the case, rocks and shelves, not visible at present, may wreck the vessel. And I was just looking at an article in Al Aram about um, people in Tunisia having a demonstration calling for Sharia law. And so, and I think back to Washington going from one extreme to another, he warned. He got the French Revolution right. Do his words apply to our own day? Okay. Uh, Elliot. Um, I can give you a firm maybe. <laughs> um, the, we don't know yet. I mean, the, after all, uh, the, um, the changes in governments began roughly a year ago. There are very significant changes in many years replacing regimes that were there for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we also don't, I mean, we know from the experience of, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia and some others, Islamists tend to do best in the first election. Um, Dennis mentioned some of the reasons why before, because they have the opportunity to organize, because they, in the eyes of many people in the country, they stand for um, uh, integrity. They weren't part of the old corrupt system. Um, but then what happens is they get elected and they can't produce in many cases. Uh, Islam is not the answer. It doesn't tell you how to create economic growth, jobs. Um, and so in a second or third election, of course, then you have to have a second or third election. If there is one, then the tide tends to recede. Now, will that happen? 
in Tunisia. And by the way, if it happens in Tunisia, that proves nothing about whether it will happen in Libya or Egypt. I, I think uh, the truth is um, we don't know. But let's just say one thing. In the Egyptian revolution, almost all the casualties were in the first 18 days of the revolt, and they were governments shooting at demonstrators. Since that time, it has been a remarkably peaceful revolution. And they did have a conduct the freest and fairest election probably in the history of, of Egypt. So, you know, I think there are all the risks, and it all could go south. But I think you have to give the Egyptian people some credit for um, what they've done uh, so far. And we ought to give them such help as we can and that they're willing to accept. Because it matters how this comes out. Remember, there's another revolution that was made in the name of freedom and democracy in 1979, and that was the Iranian Revolution, and it got hijacked, and it has been the principal problem in the Middle East for the next 30 years. So how these revolutions come out really matters to the people there, but also to us. And that's why we need to be providing such help as we can. Yeah, I, just, I think this is, a, this is the beginning of a story. We're seeing chapter one of what's going to be at least a 10-chapter book that's going to emerge. We're not the authors of it. They are. But we have a huge stake in what happens there. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think... A, I don't think people who suddenly found their voice are going to lose it. B, I think we have a, a huge stake in figuring out a way, as I was saying before, to create standards of accountability because politically and economically, because they do have to deliver. Uh, and I think at this point they're showing signs, at least the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is showing signs they understand they have to deliver. I think the same in Tunisia. Uh, and, you know, it's, I, I go back to, there was one interview I read of a, um, of a woman in Cairo from one of the poorest districts who said she voted for the Muslim Brotherhood because they weren't corrupt and they would build housing. Well, you know, um, if they get in there and they don't build any housing and they don't create any jobs, um, you know, I suspect they're going to have a problem. So the key is, as Elliot said, you've got to have repeatable elections. And that's why the standards of accountability. And we'll see. We have a huge stake, but our ability to affect it is limited. Well, uh, the, the tolling of the bell reminds me that the, uh, we've, we've got to adjourn our panel here. So um, we're going to take about a 15-minute break before the next one starts. Please join me in expressing your gratitude to our panelists. So.